Hi, I'm Shade. Welcome to Coffee Bookshelves. I've been reading a significant amount of non-fiction recently and it's quite unusual for me because two degrees sort of burnt the habit of reading academic texts out of my soul but I've gone back in the habit because um, I'm doing research for a novel that I'm working on and I wanted to set it in a historical context and it really brought to the forefront the fact that I know no history apart from European history. So I've been expanding my knowledge of pre-colonial African history from absolutely nothing to something and I've come to two realisations. One, that there is a lot more scholarship out there than I imagined. In my defence, when you go into the average bookshop or library, the European history shelves are absolutely bulging, the Asian history shelves are pretty decently stocked, but the African shelves are like super poultry, you know, and they basically Egypt and the pyramids. So, I mean, you could say, oh, well, you're in the West, what are you expecting if you go into a Western bookshop? But it seems a bit crazy for the continent that basically birthed humanity to have hardly anything on it. Like Mulder and Scully say, the truth is out there and I have been searching for that truth and found that there's a lot more than I actually had thought. Um, the second realisation is that we need to make African history more accessible. Now this is not a new realisation, I talk about this all the time, I'm a bit of a broken record on the subject, but just we need like a Coles Notes dumbed down guide to African history for those people who don't want to read like a PhD thesis in order to know what life in African communities across the centuries was like. I recently watched a Korean drama called The Red Sleeve and it's a fictional retelling of a famous historical romance between a Josian king and a lowly palace maid who becomes his concubine and it is sweeping, it is majestic, heartwarming, soul shattering super just amazingly well done and i felt like i learned so much about you know politics in that time and place about the leisure activities of the rich the fashion the royal customs the system of government i mean you know it's not a historical text but it gives you a starting point for further historical research and I was so jealous because I really want like a high budget thoughtful accessible treatment for African historical figures and stories I want cartoons and comic books and films and musicals and nursery rhymes like the whole media gamut deployed to tell African stories but this is not Shade's wish list so what have I been reading? I'm going to start actually with a podcast. So remember I'm going from zero knowledge of pre-colonial African history to getting like a basic foundation and also Africa is vast and so it's, it helps if you zero in on a location. So I sort of chose West Africa and I found this podcast series called Fall of Civilizations and it's by author, journalist and historian Paul Cooper and the particular episode that I liked in that series is called The Songhai Empire, Africa's Age of Gold and it's sort of two hours and 16 minutes long but it's actually a great example of what I was describing when I said accessible media because it uses all these storytelling techniques that make it very easy to follow, there's music breaking up all you know breaking up the information, he uses actors for the different voices, there's sound effects so it doesn't feel like a lecture, it really feels like you're going on a journey. And it starts with the first West African Empire, which is like the Ghana Empire, which was from say the 6th to the 10th century, Does makes a brief stop in the Mali Empire, which is Mansa Musa, the richest dude to ever live. Um, and then it goes on to the Songhai Empire, which was a medieval empire that sort of ran from 1340s to sort of the 1590s and covered Niger, Mali, Mauritania, Senegal, Nigeria, Guinea, Gambia, Algeria, Burkina Faso, Ivory Coast, like it was vast. Um, and it traces the rise and fall of the first ruler, King Sunni Ali, down to the last ruler, um, Ashkia Ishkak II. Um, he was the top guy when Morocco invaded um, West Africa in 1591. Now, that's so interesting to me because I was like, wait, Morocco invaded West Africa? Do you know what it takes to invade West Africa from North Africa? You gotta cross the Sahara and you've gotta have food and water. You're probably gonna lose a number of troops on the way. You probably know that the people you're going to invade know that you're coming. So you gotta be prepared for them to mount a defense. Like, you have to be so invested and determined to be like, we're gonna invade that country across the desert. <laughs> but also, if you're on the other side and then you lose to the army that's coming across the Sahara Desert, man, 
you didn't have any chance you were a lost cause already what can i say um but yeah <laughs> it covers so it covers that whole period so then you know i moved on from that podcast which i just felt like i just gained so much in terms of context and just foundational knowledge and went on to this book now i should say i went on to this book which is called the history of the eurobears because i actually already had this on my bookshelf um and but i had been sort of kind of dipping in and out of it and i i still do there's still bits that i haven't quite i haven't quite got to yet but i'm gonna sort of take a step back and talk about the origin of this book um you know how it came together because it's actually as fascinating as the book itself let me bring it closer it is written by reverend samuel johnson who was a yoruba historian and anglican vicar and he spent 20 odd years working on this it basically you know he was interviewing people and getting oral histories and plotting the history of the yoruba people who are the people in the southern part of nigeria and he finished it in 1897 he typed the book out on a typewriter and there was like one copy of this manuscript and he sent it off to a british publisher because there were no publishers in nigeria at that time and then he well they received it and they were planning to publish it but then they misplaced it the only copy of this manuscript and then the reverend died four years later in 1901 but his younger brother dr obadiah johnson was like we are not going out like that my brother spent 20 years working on this thing and i'm not gonna let all that research go to waste so he basically went over the reverend samuel's notes cobbled them all back together again basically spent 16 years putting this book back together again he then the, the doctor died in 1920 and the book was published a year later in 1921 which was 24 years after reverend samuel had actually originally completed it and but it's been in print ever since and it's thought of as sort of a seminal pioneering historical study of the yoruba people and anybody who writes has written any subsequent books about the yoruba you know you sort of use this as a foundational text so it, you could say it was worth you know the 40 odd years they they spent working on this book i've read bits and like i'm most interested in the first third of it because it looks at the people the country the language the religion the government and the customs whereas the sort of second two-thirds of it are more about the politics and war war and more war so like all the tribes that were the Yoruba tribes that were fighting in the 1800s and the relationship with the British who sort of swooped in to be like we'll help you fix all this but FYI we're about to steal your country that's by the by so the bits that I liked really you know sort of inspired me to discover more and I went on to this book which is called Formation, The Making of Nigeria from Jihad to Al Amalgamation. And it's written by two sort of um, financial professionals, Fola Fagbule and Fei Hinmi, um, who, yeah, they work in the financial services, but were just super interested in this topic and embarked on the project to create this book. And it's really interesting to have financial experts write about history because they're always like, follow the money kind of thing that in terms of how communities and societies are formed their perspective on it is very much you know a big part of it is well where did the financing come from so that was I thought just like a really interesting take their sort of historical text starts the story really gets going with the Sokoto Caliphate uh, which was like a new West African empire in northern Nigeria that developed in like 1804 and it became the political and economic center of Nigeria of so of that northern Nigerian region and then it sort of travels downriver from Sokoto to Yoruba land and it dives into the the Yoruba troubles that led to you know all the intertribal wars that this book <laughs> talks about in great length and it sort of adds color to these events of the time it's like the purchase of Louisiana in 1803 that doubled the size of the continental US and increased the demand for labor-intensive cotton, encouraged the capture of Africans for the slave market and also the expansion of sort of Spanish and Portuguese colonies which again then increased demand for slaves to work that land. It looks at how the, the Yoruba wars which had been very political had this additional edge of either feeding or avoiding the slave raiding expedition so i feel like this book is such a sort of layered and complex and compelling just exploration of how different factors at that time were interacting it's also there's also sort of a personal aspect for me because my father's sort of hometown was i discovered in this book how that 
city had been a haven for Yoruba people who were fleeing from all the different wars and from the slave raiding and they found refuge in Abekuta which means under the rock and because when you know when there was danger about you could run up this mountain and you could hide within its crevices and it was very hard for people to find you i just thought that you know that was quite interesting to see how that city had sort of established in 1827 and how it came to be so many interesting details like how lagos didn't know this at all lagos was so entrenched in the slave trade and so addicted to the you know the money from it that it had a partnership with Portuguese slave dealers while somewhere like Abekul Tower was more liberal and more anti-slavery and so they sort of partnered with the British who had just had a come to Jesus moment and were like oh <laughs> slavery is bad we'll support anybody who is fighting against it and how that put sort of Lagos and Abekul Tower at loggerheads and increased the tension between the two places. So it runs from, you know, like I said, the Sokotor Caliphate in 1804 down to 1914, which was the start of the First World War and just, you know, covers a lot of ground. So it's, it's such a gripping and interesting exploration of that period. Now, the two guys who wrote it also have a podcast. It's just 13 episodes, but they talk about the research that they did for this book and they answer listener questions and they expand on some of the themes in it. And it's really interesting. So that is on Apple Podcasts. Might be on other platforms too. I've only heard on Apple, but you should definitely listen out for that. So this is just a great, a great book to get into. Then this book made me, sort of led me on to this one called The Yoruba From Prehistory to the Present. And I picked this one up in a London bookshop last Christmas. And it's written by two professors, Professor Ari Bidesi Usman, who is a professor of anthropology, and Professor Toyin Falola, who is a professor of humanities. And this book dives into all the stuff that I really enjoy about, again, the history of the Yorubas. So it gets into the art, religion, Econ economics, if I could speak, economics, political systems and all that kind of thing is a very broad canvas. It starts off in the Stone Age and runs right up to the general election of 2015. But it really gets into the details that make what makes up a society, a community, a place. And as a writer, this stuff is just manner from the heavens for me because it's so interesting to to just to get that color of people in the place so things like you know i learned about pre-colonial and markets and how the larger markets involved different guilds so you'd have the association of cloth traders of the association of pepper traders of mat traders of butchers and each association would have its own constitution and you know the members would have to abide by that and then the association would act as a lobby group in that market trying to get better facilities for people for the traders and maybe arranging for groups to sell particular products at set prices so super interesting to me and then you know it talks about sort of the main trade routes there was the northeast and there was the east west and so the east west trade routes the main commodity was salt and but also something like ori which is sheer butter and because it's fat for cooking and it's fuel for lighting and it's used in traditional medicine so just you know the kinds of things that really had value there is a really interesting quote by Thomas Jefferson Bowen who was an American missionary and he traveled to parts of Yoruba land in 1850. Let me find it. And he described one of the markets in this way. The principal marketing hour and the proper time to see all the wonders is the evening. At half an hour before sunset all sorts of people, men, women, girls, travelers lately arrived in the caravans, farmers from the fields and artisans from their houses are pouring in from all directions to buy and sell and talk. At the distance of half a mile, their united voices roar like the waves of the sea. As the shades of evening deepen, if the weather allows the market to continue and there is no moon, every woman lights her little lamp and presently the market presents to the distant observer the beautiful appearance of innumerable bright stars. So beautiful. So I was absolutely at the beginning of my journey of learning more about pre-colonial Africa, but it's just, it's, it's an amazing journey so far. And what can I say? Anybody who's interested in learning more about this continent that we all should absolutely know so much more about, these books are a really great starting point. So go forth, grow and learn.